This is a download from the BBC. To find out more and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk. Hello. This week, three high-profile illustrations that the BBC does not always do the predictable. First... It's... Peter Capaldi! The actor playing the new Doctor Who is best known for swearing obscenely and obsessively. Cue lots of parents facing awkward questions from children who've just looked up Peter Capaldi's best bits online. Omnishambles? Only time will tell. And second... <laughs> Look who it is! Hiya! Hello! We won't expect... The new editor of The Archers includes in his CV sometime as producer of the famously overstated, not to say underdressed, TV soap, Footballers' Wives. Don't try and tell me I'm crazy, cos this is real! What are you all about, babe? Listeners welcome the new Archers editor to Ambridge. Enjoy your new job and bring back a bit of genuine fun to such a long-standing programme. And third, proof that dreams can become reality. I have always wanted to read out the football results. Oh, have you? Ever since I was about six years old. That's something I would love to do. Charlotte Green, the much-loved and much-missed voice of Radio 4, is the subject of a sensational soccer transfer. She is to be the new voice of Five Lives football results. The head of BBC Radio Sport explains his decision. She just was the perfect candidate. And actually, James Alexander Gordon emailed me to say he could not think of anybody better to take over. Before that a programme which states its intentions very clearly in its title, Hard Talk. Opera is one of the least-watched art forms in the world and possibly the most expensive. That's Sarah Montague, better known to listeners as one of the presenters of the Today programme. She was introducing an edition of Hard Talk, a series which specialises in hard-hitting interviews and goes out first on BBC World Service, that's radio, and later on the BBC News TV channel. She was interviewing the renowned baritone Thomas Hampson and her line of attack was clear from the start. It is hard not to see opera as anything other than elite and yet you have said that it's relevant to people of all walks of life. Would you really say that of it now? Absolutely. Without, without question, without reservation. Many listeners, and particularly opera fans, were appalled by what they saw as the one-sided line being taken and emailed feedback at bbc.co.uk to complain. Hello, my name is Graham Jenkins. I take serious complaint not at Sarah Montague, but at the, of the producers of Hard Talk and their interview with Thomas Hampson, in that all the arguments about opera being inaccessible and elitist and only for the elderly simply isn't true anymore. When I was a student, opera used to be much more expensive than going to a professional football match. It's now completely the reverse. And yet, at the moment, the only people really watching opera are the richest, most well-educated in the world. It is a I'm Hilary Muggridge from London, and I just wanted to say about the programme that there were perfectly legitimate and interesting questions to be asked. But in the main, this was just lazy journalism, juvenile lo nose-thumbing, spouting the same sad old clichés, foreign languages, ancient plots, fat singers, old and tiny audiences, high prices. A real disservice to the BBC, given its coverage and contribution to the arts over the years to opera itself and, most of all, to Thomas Hampson as distinguished member of the profession. It is a tiny percentage of uh, the world that sees opera and perhaps understands it. Well, since this is hard talk, I get to push back a little bit. I'm not sure that's entirely true. Thomas Hampson is one of the world's great baritones, but as far as I know, he's never been in charge of an opera house, and maybe there should be another hard talk programme with perhaps the artistic directors of Covent Garden and English National Opera or Welsh National Opera being grilled about what they're doing to increase accessibility. Now, we should note that there was clearly an element of orchestration in the howls of protest. Our email address was given out on a classical music website, but the sense of outrage was genuine. And one complainant, Alex Robinson from Oxford, found himself at the centre of the storm after writing a letter to the BBC. He told me there were a number of things about the interview to which he objected. I appreciate that the hard talk interviewing style is confrontational and robust and devil's advocate style. But this seemed to go somewhat over a line into presenting opposing viewpoints as fact. I suppose the second point was really the, the tone of the questioning. Uh, Mr Hampson gave some very, very detailed, very eloquent and very thoughtful answers to Sarah Montague and her questioning. 
And it just seemed that she didn't really take any of those comments on board. It seemed that she had a, a list of questions to get through a, a set of agenda. So you wrote the letter to uh, the BBC, got a very long and detailed reply for them, but then it's gone viral, your letter. How come? The whole reason I got on to writing a letter was I, dis- I was discussing it with a few friends who are singers who had very similar reactions to me. And I wrote this letter and emailed it to them, and they said, yeah, this is, this is fantastic. We ought to circulate this amongst our friends. So pretty much as an afterthought, I stuck it on my Facebook account and didn't really think about it much more. And I logged in about an hour later, and it had been seen about 1,500 times. Half an hour after that, it had been seen 5,000 times. How many people have now actually um, read your Facebook page? I know it's been recommended by uh, critic Norman Lebrecht, but what's the score now? Last time I checked, which was this morning before going on this programme, it's been read by 138,000 individual readers, which, um, frankly, I, I'm actually blown away by, and I still haven't quite had time to process what all that means. The feedback I've had has been overwhelmingly supportive. Well, uh, we asked the BBC, as you would expect us to do, if someone from Hard Talk could come onto the programme to address your concerns and others. Ah, uh, They said no-one was available. Uh, instead, they sent us this statement. Hard Talk which is first broadcast on the BBC's international channels, is about robust interviews, where a guest is questioned in detail about their role or area of work. All interviews are backed up by detailed evidence and research. This programme was no different. It examined the international issues around opera and asked Thomas Hampson for his position on these widely discussed topics. This was an articulate and engaged discussion which gave Mr Hampson ample space to respond while ensuring the interview had relevance to Hard Talk's millions of viewers around the world. What's your reaction to that, Alex? Well, I have to say I find that pretty unconvincing. They're obviously very keen on emphasising that Hard Talk claims an international general audience. As they said in their reply to me, many of them will never have been to an opera, some of them might never even have heard of opera. So I'd like them to ask themselves this. If you've never been to an opera or you've never heard of opera before, what impression would you take away from this interview? Would you be tempted to attend? And to me, the prevailing tone seems to be overwhelmingly negative, and I argue it would actually deter people from discovering opera. How does that fit in with the BBC's remit to educate, inform and entertain? Alex Robinson, thanks very much. Now... After months of feverish speculation, the new incumbent of one of the most high-profile jobs in global broadcasting was revealed earlier this week. The new, wait for it, the new editor of The Archers is Sean O'Connor, and he's well acquainted with life in Ambridge. When he takes over from long-serving editor Vanessa Whitburn in September, Sean O'Connor will be revisiting characters he helped develop when he was an Archers producer in the 1990s. Characters like Ed Grundy. I'd love her to be able to, to have a day away from it all and some time to herself. I'd, I'd love to be able to do that for her. I should be able to do that for her. And he reintroduced Lillian Bellamy. You have no idea how Matt feels about me. Come back! And how dare you call me a prostitute! I didn't call you a prostitute. I said he treated you like one. Don't you ever listen? Oh, just shut up! So he's a lot to answer for, or be proud of. But Sean O'Connor left gentle village life for the cities to produce heart-hitting storylines about domestic violence for EastEnders and teen angst for Channel 4's Hollyoaks, before moving on to the somewhat salacious world of footballers' wives on ITV. A quick online search on that series reveals a storyline in which a character kills her older husband by having over-energetic sex with him after spiking his drink with Viagra. Even Lillian might blanch at that. It's a background that's raised a few eyebrows among listeners posting on the BBC blog. Oh, no, please don't let him turn it into EastEnders. I only hope he realises that The Archers is not EastEnders or Hollyoaks. That's the reason I listen to it. Under Whitburn, the entire USP of the programme has been forgotten. Then the abomination and all-round confusion of Ambridge Extra. So from me, Mr O'Connor, good luck. But many others expressed their approval of the appointment. Many congratulations to Sean. He sounds just the right person for the job, someone who really knows how drama works. Welcome to Mr O'Connor. I hope he has a long and happy time with my favourite programme. I look forward to seeing how he shapes the contemporary drama. The job advertisement for the new Arches editor asked for someone who was able to say sorry when you get it wrong. It's a small word but one that feedback and Archer's listeners have cried out to be uttered over the recent Ambridge Extra scheduling decisions. 
But life for the editor of one of the most high-profile, well-loved soaps on any medium isn't just about knowing when to apologise. You need the thickest of skins. When Vanessa Whitburn spoke to feedback earlier this year about her retirement, she told me just how fearsome some Archer's listeners can be. I wouldn't call it a serious death threat, but, you know, people who are saying, yeah, why don't we kill Whitburn rather than Nigel, stuff like that, you have to ignore it. It's a, People are very sad, those people. Most of my listeners whom I meet and talk to are fantastic and galvanising and interesting and we can debate things forever. So Sean can be under no illusions that it's a tough job he's taking up. We did ask for an interview, but we're told we'd have to wait till he got his feet under the desk. But we hope to be speaking to him in the next series. In the meantime, listener Janet Mansfield has taken time to write an open letter to the new editor. Dear Mr O'Connor, welcome to your post. I've been very concerned about the direction the Archers has been going in, but now have great hopes for the future, and I would like to make a few points for you to consider. As you know, having worked on the programme before, Radio 4 listeners are an intelligent group of people who crucially can sustain a story for a long time and in fact appreciate one that develops well and concludes in a believable and satisfactory manner. I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad tidings, Lillian. I, I should have thought. Lillian? Listeners are aware that rural issues are not necessarily dull and sleepy. They are also aware that rural life has changed out of all proportion to that of the 1950s when the archers began. The ready meals, outsourcing the milk, is all part of the same story. And what is that story, Tom? Progress! So, enjoy your new job and bring back a bit of genuine fun to such a long-standing programme. Thank you, Janet. We will ensure Mr O'Connor gets the message. And, of course, if you've anything you'd like to say about the future direction of the Archers, please do get in touch. You can write to us at feedback, P.O. Box 67234, London SE1P 4AX, or you can leave a phone message on 03 333 444. Standard landline charges apply, but it could cost more on some mobile networks. Or you can send an email to feedback at bbc.co.uk, or you can even tweet at BBC R4 Feedback. All those details are on our website where you'll also find details of how you can apply to be in the audience at a special feedback programme devoted entirely to BBC Radio Comedy, broadcast from the Edinburgh Fringe on August the 23rd. Twycross Zoo in Leicestershire closed briefly this morning after a chimpanzee managed to slip out of its living area. Keepers tempted it to return with ice cream and fizzy drinks. We're bringing you news of a fatberg. It's the biggest ever found in a UK sewer. It's as big as a London bus, we're told. It's weighing... 15 tonnes. Runaway chimpanzees and fatbergs. Ah, yes, we're well and truly in the silly season. The summer months when news editors the world over are left scratching their heads over how to fill their papers or programmes. British sportsmen have done their best to help. The Lions' victory in Australia, Murray winning Wimbledon and the retaining of the Ashes filled lots of pages and minutes. But for hard news programmes, the going is tough. Parliament is not in session. Business bigwigs are sunning themselves somewhere exotic. Even the BBC has stopped making headlines. One programme which relies more than most for its content on the machinations of Westminster is The World at One. Its editor, Nick Sutton, has been telling me how his team cope in the long summer months. I don't think we necessarily become a different programme. I think you have to work a bit harder. The sort of diary stories that you sort of expect, you know, you know are going to happen during the... Parliamentary, yes. Prime Minister's questions, well, that'll fill up ten minutes, yes, with a bit of luck, a bit more. That's gone. Yeah, that's gone. So you have to be a bit more, I think, imaginative and creative in, in what you're doing. But I don't think necessarily we move away that far from what we normally do. So it's interesting, over the last week, you know, we did a long interview with George Osborne, this week, you know, probably longer actually than we would have done outside the summer. You know, I think we spoke to him for about 14 minutes or something. But, you know, I'd, I'd still see that as the sort of core journalism that the World at One normally does. But the fact is that a lot of uh, politicians are on holiday. They've run away. Is there a danger that all you do is take someone like George Osborne and give him a lot more time than you would normally 
want or on the programme, and that's actually in some ways placed to their advantage. Yeah, I think you're right. There is a danger that you could give them more airtime than they deserved. But I think the interesting thing, you know, looking back at our running orders from the last couple of weeks, is that actually almost every day there have been stories that we've decided to drop. We had actually too many stories. We could have sort of filled a whole hour of the programme uh, most days with stories without letting things, I think, run too long. You know, looking at some of those lighter stories that we've done, we did a piece this week on uh, Bob Dylan's portraits that are going to be um, displayed at the National Portrait Gallery. We did a piece about... Dare I say, they don't appear to be a very high quality, but there we are. Yeah, it has to be said, the, the director of the National Portrait Gallery didn't seem overly keen on them. Right. Um, but we also did a piece about Virgin you know, quite a big issue in the countryside. You know, should verges be cut back, giving drivers sort of clear views, or should we let them grow during the summer so that you can have wildflowers and the insects and butterflies and things that that helps sustain? So I think they're sort of not serious, hard news stories, but they're still things that we think the audience will still be interested in. Because some people might say this is a real opportunity to actually get out in the country. If you accept the argument that the news sometimes seems rather different to people in Edinburgh and Newcastle than it does in London, wouldn't this be an opportunity during the summer to get out there, and if not actually present the programme from those places, although why not, to try and look at the news from their perspective and what really matters to them. Yeah. Well, you see, I think, you know, some of these things, like that Burgess story, it's not a story that affects most of my production team who live here in London, but it, it matters to people in the countryside. But I sometimes wonder whether or not that means that when Parliament reassembles and the national politics takes over, once more those sort of stories go away... And the London agenda dominates. You know, it's interesting. We have on our programmes quite a close relationship with our audience. So, you know, we're always asking them to email us and contact us. And we do pick up on the stories that they suggest. So I think, I hope that, you know, we won't get too dominated by the London political agenda. And we will still do the stories that, you know, people are talking about around the country. Nick Sutton, editor of The World at One. Now, a dream come true. Earlier this year, the BBC announced the winners of the first Writer's Prize for Radio. From over a 1,000 scripts, three winners were chosen, two in drama and one in comedy. Like Radio 4's comedy sketch show, the show What You Wrote, which was written by members of the public, many of the entrants in the Writer's Prize were radio novices. That prize was the chance of a commission for BBC Radio. Six months later, and the first of the dramas has come to fruition. This satisfaction... Fifteen letters fits in with sixteen across. Cheers. No problem, Lee, my friend. Budge over, I need to use the crapper. Bang Up is set in a Young Offenders Institute. It aired on Thursday in the afternoon drama slot and was written by first-time radio writer Sarah Hackier. I spoke to Sarah shortly before the drama was broadcast and asked her how she got the radio bug. On my first day at university, we got the freshest pack at Manchester University. This was 20 years ago. In it were the, the usual things, you know, free chocolate, the ticket to the Pogues concert that I sold. I, I wi- did, too, but there were <laughs> I wish I'd gone to it now. And also a, a Radio 4 um, tape. A Not Radio 4 tape? Yeah, there, there was a radio... Who ra- put that in there? I, don't, I, don't, I assume BBC Radio 4. I'd be really interested oh, if them, anyone yeah. else remembers it. It was there in our freshers pack. It was just a taster of the programmes on and there was radio drama on it. On my own, first night away from home, I um, listened to it. And I was an addict. You know, it's been the background to my life ever since. So, bang up your winning play. Can you tell me about the subject matter? Why did you choose it? I'd worked in a Young Offenders Institute about 18 months prior to writing this. And I I knew I wanted to write a story based in a Young Offenders Institute. I found it surprising being there as a teacher. I, I suppose I had the same expectations as most people would, that... It would be an unhappy, fairly, very masculine environment, quite aggressive. It was all of those things, but it was also quite a tender environment. There was camaraderie between the boys, there was camaraderie between the staff, and there was all the different emotions that everybody has outside. How did you go about shaping it and finding the story that would take you through? I thought of lots of ways of doing it, and then I realised that I was a teacher and that really I should look at it from that angle, at how a teacher got to know the boys, and particularly a boy. And I wanted them to have a connection that was surprising. I know what a sleepless night feels like, and I don't envy you. Do you ever do any writing? Sometimes. Come on now, Lee, lad. Behind your door. Look over the wall, Lee. Write about what you see, how it makes you feel. You should write something for next week too, miss. My name's Emma. 
So once you'd got the idea, once you'd started writing, how did you go about trying to persuade the BBC to put it on? Well, this was the brilliant thing. I'd got it about half written. I liked it. I felt that it was had a good shape to it. And at that time on the BBC Writers' Room, the Writers' Prize was announced. So I entered the Writers' Prize with Bang Up. I finished it, working till midnight before the deadline. And... I was gobsmacked, I suppose. <laughs> of course, it's one thing to write something, it's another to have it performed by actors. When that happens, and you're sitting there for the first time, you hear the actors speaking your words, what's it like? Oh, it's amazing. I mean, uh, it, was, it was an incredible experience, and I felt um, emotional about it because they'd brought something different to it or something extra, it added a new layer to my words. Particularly the character of Lee... There were some moments where he nearly made us cry, which was really surprising when I had written that script and read it so many times and changed things that somebody then took it and made me feel like I was listening to it for the first time. The girl is excited. She's trying to catch a snowflake in her mouth. I've got a baby girl too, miss. Did I tell you that already? How does it all make me feel? Useless. Now, you've imitated Alfred Hitchcock a little, haven't you, because... You've got a cameo role yourself. Was, um, was that because the budget was tight or you really wanted to be in your own drama? <laughs> I don't know about the budget, but, I well, I didn't know I was going to do it till I was in the studio on the first day and I said, uh, who's playing the female guard? And she said, well, you are. I said, well, oh, really? I mean, I've always wanted to be a writer, not an actress. How many and words did you have? It was one line, uh, well, a couple of lines. Would you tell us what they were? Yep. Yeah. Hands above your head, out to the side. All right, turn around, off you go. <laughs> you how, go. how many times did she make you do it? I think it was about three times I did it. And I, I did keep saying to her, it's OK for you to cut my line if it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's too long. But she said, no, no, you are going to have your Hitchcock moment. <laughs> You're going to be in there. OK, hands above your head, out to the side, turn around, all right. <laughs> now, there will be some people listening to uh, this programme who have tried, have failed or are wondering whether they should try and write. Have you any advice for them? Yeah, just do it. And the more you write, I've heard this before, I've been told it, the more you write, the better you get, but it's true. Listen to radio, watch television, read the scripts on the Writer's Room website, just learn, keep doing it. It paid off for me. It's that kind of almost, it feels like an overnight success that took 20 years to get here. (laughs) My thanks to writer Sarah Hechia. And Bang Up is available to listen to on the iPlayer until Thursday. Now, there was much sadness when it was announced that this voice was to be no longer heard throughout the land. Chelsea nil, Newcastle United nil. Liverpool nil, Fulham nil. Manchester City three, Arsenal nil. But after the sadness, joy when it was announced that James Alexander Gordon's replacement as the reader of Five Lives Football Results is to be the former voice of Radio 4. Algerian forces are searching for Islamist militants who overran a remote gas storage facility and took workers hostage. We shouldn't have been surprised. This was Charlotte Green on Newsnight just before she left the BBC earlier this year. I have always wanted to read out the football results. Oh, have you? Ever since I was about six years old. That's something I would love to do. Now she's coming back to do so, and her appointment has been widely welcomed in the Twitter sphere and elsewhere. Charlotte Green reading the results won't make Birmingham losing half as bad. Great choice. Delighted to hear that Charlotte Green is going to be reading the football results on BBC Five Live, and I'm not even interested in football. Hello, this is Oriel Britton from Bristol. It's a shame Five Live didn't take up my suggestion to have a competition to replace James Alexander Gordon, but it's an absolutely splendid idea to have Charlotte Green presenting the football results. I'll certainly be tuning in. Well done, that lady. It's going to be splendid, actually, to have a woman's voice presenting the football results. Three cheers from those listeners, but a note of sadness from Deirdre Lay. I was so sorry to hear that Charlotte Green will now be on Radio 5 Live reading the football results, although I'm delighted to hear that it is her dream job. Football fans will be very lucky. I still miss her on Radio 4 especially on the news quiz. She has a smile in her magical, mellifluous voice and her laughter was always contagious. I hope another slot will be open to her on Radio 4. In the meantime, I wish her every continued success. Thank you. Bye. It's beyond our control to get her back on Radio 4, I'm afraid. 
but we can talk to the man responsible for bringing Charlotte's mellifluous tones to a new audience. Richard Burgess is the head of BBC Radio Sport. I asked him if Charlotte Green had applied for the job. No, she didn't. We heard that clip on Newsnight, or at least one of our uh, kind of smart producers did, sent me an email, said, oh, we should consider Charlotte if, if James Alexander Gordon ever retires. Of course, at that point, we had no idea that James would be going at the end of last season. That's very sad, of course, but as soon as uh, he let us know his news seemed obvious. Charlotte was the, was the obvious choice, so we approached her. And there's no problem that she's an avowed Tottenham fan. I mean, you must be listening out for even the merest hint of triumphalism if, uh, say, they beat or lose to Arsenal or Chelsea or something like that. I said it is now within her gift to make sure that Spurs win every single week. <laughs> um, but, uh, yes, um, no concerns about that. Uh, I think she will be uh, the perfect professional. But she's also a woman. Is it, was this in the back of your mind? Uh, one of her former colleagues on Radio 4, Alice Arnold, wrote saying she's the perfect antidote to Five Lives Land culture. Was that an element in your thinking? It really wasn't. Uh, she just was the perfect candidate. And actually, James Alexander Gordon emailed me to say he could not think of anybody better to take over and that she's the perfect choice. You always wanted Charlotte Green, but did she have to do a sort of demo tape? Did she have to audition in front of you? Yes. Uh, she met up with me and the person who's been producing the classified football results for around 30 years, Audrey. We met up, we gave a little run-through from actually the scores from last weekend and she immediately got that rhythm and that clarity and the intonation of the voice. So she ran through the scores from last weekend and she finished and we just kind of said, well, we've no, we've no doubts. Can we have a sneak preview? We didn't record it. Ah. <gasps> Now, she's not starting there till the end of September. What's happening in the meantime? She's on holiday, and so one of our staff reporters, Kevin Howells, will continue to uh, read the classifieds. He's done it before. In fact, he was he actually stepped in the one time when James Alexander Gordon couldn't do it because he was stuck in traffic. So Kevin knows what he's doing, and, and Kevin will keep hold of things until Charlotte takes hold of it. He's not over. too disappointed to be the bridesmaid. No, well, there were lots of people who wanted to take over from James Alexander Gordon. It's such a prestigious kind of role. It's interesting. I don't think there are many moments on radio that have quite that resonance still. You know, the sports report theme and then the classified football results. So I was contacted by many, many people who were keen to take over from James. Uh, but as I said, for me, it was always Charlotte who I thought was the best uh, candidate. Richard Burgess, head of BBC Radio Sport. Oh, and still on the subject of dreams, just time to hear my dream score again. Carlisle United 8, Manchester United 1. Oh, Charlotte. Please make it happen. Goodbye.